Hi, everybody. Good evening. Welcome to the Evoke Therapy Program's broadcast. Uh, tonight, we're going to be talking about a book and, uh, that's written by a, uh, somebody who wrote w my favorite book on boundaries, Dr. Harriet Lerner. And I, I got the chance to meet Harriet Lerner uh, a couple of years ago. We had her speak to, at a professional conference that we were at, and I just found her to be a joy and I found her to be a joy interacting with since then. She told me that this book was her husband's favorite. I think that's what made me believe it was about marriage. And as I got into it, we're, we're reviewing the dance of connection tonight. As I got into it and I saw all the examples, I thought about how few of them were about marriage and how so many of them were about other relationships, parent-child relationships, sister-to-sister -sister relationships. And of course, there were some, some marriage relationships and, and some other relationships. And what that got me thinking about was, again, with, with my new book, the, the Audacity to Be You, about the universality of the principles, right? There are specific differences in all of our relationship, right? I was thinking about touch, for example. We, we touch our spouses differently than we touch our children, than we touch a business acquaintance. You're going to shake hands with a business acquaintance, maybe a friend. You might give a hug or, or a kiss on the cheek, uh, much more intimate with a, with a partner, a life partner or, or a spouse. With a child, you're going to give them a hug and cuddles as they are younger, and some of that will change over time, right? So the, the, the context and specifics can be different and change, but there's so much more that is the same when we think about relationships and connection. And I really, I don't always say this about books that I review, but this is one that I highly recommend. As I go through the, the broadcast this evening, I'm going to be clear because I'm, I'm quoting her quite a bit tonight. I'm going to be clear for those of you listening to the podcast version of this to, to, to start with a quote and end with an unquote when I'm quoting Dr. Lerner. So let me get into it. The first thing that I find fascinating about this and that I think speaks to the work that we do, and I, I won't, I won't uh, give credit to my book tonight over and over again, but in writing a book about relationships, I was very clear that it had to start off with what it meant to be an individual self, an individual person. And I think what is profound about Dr. Lerner's book, and I, I find her to be a very wise, very, very wise guide, is that she talks as much about boundaries in this book as anything. So when you're thinking about relationships with your children or your spouse or partner, really the, the place to start is to think about boundaries, right? Where do you connect? How do you connect? Can you maintain a sense of self? I'll get to this and conclude with this story at the end, but there's a there's a quote in her book where she talks about uh, confronting gently, appropriately, assertively her father when he said something that, that she found hurtful. And she said this, she said, quote, I needed to hear the sound of my own voice without backing down. So, so much of what we do requires us to let go of the outcome, requires us to let go of where other people change. I may have told this story recently on a podcast or a broadcast recently, but I'll, I'll retell it. My wife recently, some weeks ago, had a difficult interaction with our youngest, our 12-year-old. And after she came to bed and we were talking, she shared, shared to me how the, the, the interaction went and that it didn't go as well as she would have hoped or, or liked it to go. And she then asked me for feedback. You know, what, what do you think? What would you do? And, and I really didn't think that there was anything that she could have done differently, right? The, the, there was nothing that could predict that um, the outcome that my wife wanted from our 12 year old. So the conversation got into a little argument because I wasn't giving her what she wanted me to. I wasn't giving her direction or advice or feedback. And I think maybe she thought saw it as disinterested. And, and when we talked the next day, I said, you know, I, I thought about it. And if I were going to give you feedback, I, I think the feedback I would give you is be different. So you can imagine how silly it would be for me to give that feedback to you. But really, that's what Dr. Lerner talks about so much. And that's why her, her books, I align with them so much, is it's it's learning how to be different. She, she's great at giving practical tools. She's great at offering skills and, and concepts. But she also gets to the heart of the matter and talks about our sensibility, our way of being, how we show up, who we are, what's inside. She tells this story, and I quote, two little kids are playing together in a sandbox in the park with their pal with their pails and shovels. Suddenly, a huge fight breaks out, and one of them runs away screaming, I hate you, I hate you. In no time at all, they're back in the sandbox, playing together as if nothing happened. Two adults observe the interaction from a nearby bench. Did you see that? One comments in admiration. 
How did the children do that? They were enemies five minutes ago. It's simple, the other one replies. They chose happiness over righteousness, unquote. And, and, and I think that that's, that's a fundamental idea that, that, that I know to be true, that if we, we try to be right, and I, he uses the word righteousness, if we try to be right or good, if, they, if we need to be those things, it's going to be hard to connect. Conversely, when we learn what it means to be a person, to be a self, to be ourselves, we are empowered and free and able to connect to each other. She talks about this idea about suffering and relationship. And, and basically, like I said, this is a book about how to be like those children that she described in that prologue, that opening story in her prologue. She starts with the idea of finding your voice and, 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 and distinguishing finding your voice and speaking your truth from getting anybody to change, which for those of you who've been doing this work a little bit longer, you understand the difference and, and how powerful it can be. And, and ironically, the impact it can have on, on those around you that, that you love and that love you. She says, quote, truth is nothing you say can ensure that the other person will get it or respond the way you want. You may never exceed his threshold of deafness. She may never love you, not now or ever. And if you are courageous in initiating, extending or deepening a difficult conversation, you may feel even more anxious and uncomfortable, at least in the short run. So part of the, the project, the starting point for the project in, in connection is finding you, right? That's the name of this podcast. We just changed it a couple of weeks ago. It's finding you. That's the name of the intensives. That is the, the, the initial ingredient, the building block upon which connection begins, can, can exist, can be developed. And, and without some work in finding you, and she talks about it as finding your, your authentic voice, your authentic self, without doing that work, connection is impossible. And, and many people want to skip the step of finding their voice and finding themselves. Dr. Lerner says, I quote, a mental therapist recently teased me. She said, are you writing another book to help women speak up? I'm trying to help my clients be quiet. Then she more serious, then she uh, asked more seriously, said, why do people think they have to tell each other everything they feel? I, I find this to be an error in thinking for a lot of people that intimacy is, is almost measured on the, the amount of words that, that are used, the amount of sharing that goes on. And I've talked about this. I talk about this in the new book that, that such an important and maybe the more difficult Part of intimacy is being quiet and listening, holding space and containing somebody else, learning to take care of yourself, your anxiety somewhere else with somebody else so that you can be present and supportive for, for, for the women that are listening. And it's not it's not relegated to women in, in heterosexual relationships or women in general. Um, but but oftentimes I hear women wives complain about their husbands, about lacking intimacy when one question that, that can be asked, that can be helpful is, is there something that I'm doing or not doing that makes it difficult for him to speak? I think that the, the, the story that I refer to sometimes with Charles Schultz, for those of you old enough, and most of you, if your parents, you're old enough, you remember the Peanuts cartoons, right? And you remember the, the, the repeating episode, um, almost like a repeating nightmare where Lucy tries to ask Charlie to kick the football and promises, right? Assures him that she's going to hold it this time. And when you're watching that, when I was watching that as a little kid, first, I never wanted Charlie Brown to, to fall for it, right? And then when he finally agreed, I thought, please, please, Charles, please let him kick it this time. And of course, I believe invariably she pulled it away every time. That's people's experience and in intimacy, right? That's sometimes women, and sometimes men's experience and in intimacy is that it's not going to go well. And she talks about and tells a story, Dr. Lerner does, about her own father. And why, because of his own childhood wounding, he found it more um, doable to, to, to stay quiet and, and to let his wife, Dr. Lerner's mother, lead things, take really control of situations and of their lives in many ways. And I'll talk about that. I love this quote. She's talking about her, her younger son, Ben, ben whom, whom, by the way, apparently is a fantastic 
novelist and just wrote a book that was that was on um, Barack Obama's book list, among others. Um, so he's written a book, but she says, quote, my younger son, Ben, once summoned up this dilemma, talking about finding your voice and maintaining it in the presence of, of family, of others. I, I call it the, the gravitational, the emotional and gravitational pull of the other and how we lose ourselves. My younger son, Ben, she says, once summoned up this dilemma nicely when my husband, Steve, was driving him home from the airport during the winter break of his sophomore year of college. You know, Dad, Ben said matter-of-factly, as we get closer and closer to home, I can just feel the layers of maturity peeling off me. I love this story for so many reasons. One, it's it's another reminder, as Dr. Lerner does so well, to be kind to ourselves. It's a reminder of context that cause us to regress. When I hear people talking about their current day relationships, either with their children or with their spouses or partners, I, I often help them to see eventually the idea that the problem existed longer, long before you met or had your child, long before you met your partner. And in many ways, these new relationships pull you back in some way, something triggering, something fundamental, fundamental and elemental about the relationship pulls you back to your childhood. That's why I believe so strongly. I, I know so clearly that the root of our work whether it's for our children or with our partners, is in unraveling our childhood. Dr. Lerner says, quote, not all men want to run the show. I recognize this simple fact early in my childhood by observing my parents' marriage. My father, Archie, was the accommodating partner while my mother, Rose, made all the decisions. She decided how money would be managed and spent, how my sister and I would be reared, and what art would hang on the walls and just about everything else. Archie allowed it to be her call whether he would have one egg or two, seconds on desserts, or whether he would get the burned piece of toast. I never heard him protest, not even when Rose packed him a leftover string bean sandwich for lunch, unquote. And and what Dr. Lerner does and and traces back for us is Archie's family of origin, his his mother, Dr. Lerner's grandparents. And there there was an ethos of loyalty in her grandparents' family her paternal grandparents' family. and um, But what also exists in this family is that there, there were things that were said, that, that if said, and, and if conflict arose, and it was significant enough that there was absolute and virtual e- eternal cutoff. And so Archie, having lived in that context, having been cooked in that soup, if you will, realized that, that it was just better. He had just concluded it was better to say less and to avoid conflict. And so, like so many of us, he was trying to pre- prevent something that had already happened to him, right? That this pressure that had that he'd existed in and lived in. And he had seen one of his siblings be victimized by. I think Dr. Lerner does a good job sometimes at speaking to, I suppose it's the stereotypes, but it's also, in many ways, she talks about the dominant culture that exists between the genders. She talks about men and women and and the ways that they they lose their voice. It might be more accurate. Whenever you read books that talk about men and women, it's probably more accurate to think of feminine versus masculine. One of the reasons why I like Dr. Lerner's books so much, I think, is because psychologically, I think I'm more like a woman than a man. I think I have more of that sensibility of a feminine identity, so to speak, psychologically speaking. Um, She talks about women losing their voice. She says, quote, over time, however, the costs are dear. When a woman loses her resolve to speak up and stand firmly behind her position, she may be vulnerable to depression, anxiety, headaches, chronic anger, and bitterness. Sometimes these symptoms reflect an unconscious search for truth, forcing a more honest self-appraisal, including the degree to which she is voicing her authentic values and desires and living in accord with them. And then she talks about men losing their voice. And she says, a man who feels powerless to use his voice violates our very definition of what it means to be a man. Consequently, he may then seek to prove his manhood in the most problematic ways, by being tough and aggressive, by acting up and acting out, or by removing himself emotionally from his relationships. He may be in a relationship where no one is going to tell him what to do, meaning he won't allow himself to be influenced or even moved by his partner. These are common male responses to feeling utterly helpless, 
to write things through conversation or speak with clarity, strength, and resolve. So whether or not you 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 identify with the lines that she's drawn around men and women, there are these ways that we we lose our voice and these these ways that they impact us. Right? What what is the symptom of a loss of self? And, and voice is a you know it's kind of a, a therapy speak term. That, that really is just 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 the outward. Uh, manifestation of who you are, what you feel and think, your values, what you want, whether you're hot or cold, hungry or thirsty, tired, or or, or awake and excited, right? That's that's the voice. And there are, are so many things that can threaten us from our past that can can come up in our lives in our present that that threaten us to, to lose that voice, to give up that voice, to compromise that voice. And that's why, again, the first ingredient, if, if the recipe is connection and intimacy, the first ingredient is, is, is two cells. Dr. Lerner has a great sense of humor. She first talks about, this isn't the funny part, actually. She talks about the ideal family. The ideal family encourages the unfolding of each member's true authentic voice, promoting a sense of unity and belonging. The we, she says. While respecting the separateness and differences of individual members, the I, she calls it. Parents calmly enforce rules that guide a child's behavior, but they don't attempt to regulate the child's emotions or ideas. In this way, they create a safe space where kids can feel free to speak themselves, speak and be themselves. This is what we talk about all the time, right? You can set a boundary. And in fact, it's it's essential that, that you we we if we want to grow, that we practice boundaries. That's part of being an I, a self. And we can do that with our children. And and there's no objective right way to do it in, in many cases because it's what you feel comfortable with, what you're okay with. But what we try to avoid, and we, we coach you to try to avoid, is to try to shame, guilt, coerce change your child's feelings. I think I may have told you that my 12-year-old daughter said to her math teacher recently, when he described to somebody in the class, I feel sad when you do that. She said to, to, to her teacher, you know, you don't have to shame us. You can just tell us what you expect and you don't have to shame us. And luckily for her, my daughter, I suppose, her, her math teacher saw and respected the wisdom that my 12-year-old was offering. So there's a there's a different... There's a different way of being um, where we, we, we learn to have, to set, to express our, our boundaries, our, our voice, who we are. And in ideal families, that is respected. And yet there is a shared um, set of ideas about how everybody respects everybody. Dr. Lerner, this is where the sense of humor comes in. She says, you will feel relieved to know that this perfect family doesn't exist. In my many years of clinical practice, I haven't met the family that even begins to fit the description, at least not all the, all the time. Of course, I haven't met every family, unquote. So we can talk about ideals, right? When I, I've, I've been told this before when I'm teaching. I'm talking about an idea, a concept, a relationship, skill, tool. And, and people are assuming that, that, that I'm living that way all the time. Uh, that I'm capable of all of that all the time. And, and I have to remind people, it's just, I can just talk about an ideal. What would it look like if, right? If we imagine the ideal, what the distance between where we are now today and that ideal is our work. What, what does it take to get there? Which we'll, we'll never arrive at, but what what's the work that takes us towards that? When people ask me what my work is, it's, it's the difference between you, the way you respond and the way that Yoda responds, right? Or, or pick your ideal figure, Yoda's mind. And, and the space in between me and Yoda in any given moment is where my work lies. And further, she, she quotes Mary Carr, who has this famous definition of a dysfunctional family, family as any family with one or more person in it. Talking about reaching your limit, one of the things I love about, I'm so grateful to, to be in the field of psychology is that, that the, the landscape, what we, the words that we use to describe 
human behavior and, and phenomenon is, is descriptive language instead of moralistic language. I, I think that moralistic language can be so threatening. And, and we, we don't imagine that if we abandon moralistic language that we'll ever progress morally when I find it just the opposite is true. She talks about a, a woman who reaches her limit as she's taking care of her aging, uh, I don't know if it was an in-law, it was, as her, her, her father's mother and how taxing it was. And, and she couldn't set a boundary in her effort to be a good wife, right? It was, it was beyond her capacity. She didn't want to let her, her, her husband down. Probably she didn't want to let, let down what I would call her internalized mother and father, right? What they told her to be, taught her to be, I assume. Maybe it's the dominant culture. She just couldn't let down those, those people. And so she got admitted eventually. This, this woman got admitted to a psychiatric hospital, probably having something what, that people would call a, 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 an emotional breakdown, right? And she says, Dr. Lerner, quote, thank you. Thank God, she said to Dr. Lerner, thank God the psychiatrist who admitted me to the hospital explained to my husband that I can't take care of his mother anymore. I could never have said those words myself. Of course, she did find a way to let her husband and mother-in-law know that her caretaking limits had been exceeded, but this strong woman had been able to set boundaries only by losing them. That is, by making a brief foray into mental illness herself. I think that's beautiful and sublime, right? And, and in some ways, that's what your children are, are, are doing unconsciously, is they're trying to say, something is not working in my life. And it may have something to do with you. It might have something to do with my academic trauma, my, my peers, the, the dominant culture, the culture that I live in, the school that I go to it might have something to do with all that, but it's not working for me. And, and the, uh, the, the, the wisdom to end up in a treatment facility is there. We just need to find it. Right, that becomes our mission in life as parents and loved ones of people in treatment is to find out what the, the foray into a treatment facility, a, a therapeutic program, what is it trying to tell us? To find out what where that wisdom is, to listen to it and to see what it's, it's asking of us and to see how we can respond. Dr. Lerner talks about the dominant culture. You know, when we talk about what the culture, it's really the dominant culture. And what does the dominant culture tell us? It tells us about our roles as men and women and, and adults and children, right? Partners, parents. It, it tells us, gives us rules about what can and cannot be discussed. And those rules change over time. And I, I think we're evolving. I mean, there's so much heaviness in the world right now. So much darkness, so much fear, so much anger. But I think in, in the large movement of things, we're making progress. And, and I won't go into a, a political discussion, but and I'm not talking, talking about one political par party or another, but just go back 200 years in this country and think about women's rights and, and, and racial injustices, you know, what was happening. And it's clear children's rights, right? The way we treat children. It is absolutely obvious and abundantly clear that in the, the long game, the big picture, we're making dramatic strides. I talk sometimes about the, the gift of your child's therapy. And, and sometimes my mistake is I, I say it too early, right? Sometimes I say it on an inquiry call. I tell people that are talking to me for the first time, someday you'll be thankful for this. That's too early. I've learned from most people. I had somebody, in fact, I think the person who said this is on this, this, this broadcast live right now, said to me, it's a beautiful gift wrapped in really, really, really bad wrapping paper. But there is something beautiful about our flawed families. And Dr. Lerner says it this way, quote, but here's the most reassuring fact of all. There's something to be said for being part of a real human flawed family. Painful family relationships are part of the stuff of growing up and even bad experiences foster learning. If I had to account for my choice of profession as a psychologist and writer, and the clarity of my voice, which is clear, when it's clear, she says, I'd have to give as much credit to the more wrenching details of my childhood as I would to my family's enormous resilience and strength. 
unquote. I hope what this can offer for some of us is some relief from the shame and guilt that we feel. I don't think it's embracing what Dr. Lerner is suggesting here as an abdication of responsibility as a parent or spouse to, to try to make strides and improve myself or yourself. But uh, what, I, what I will say is it gives us, it takes some of the pressure off. And, and like I said so, so many times, the more we can shed the, the guilt and the shame, the more aware we can become of our mistakes, the more willing we are to, to see them, to look at them, to, 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 to face them, and to make strides and improvements away through and away them. Dr. Dr. Lerner talks about what I, what I call it is growing up and growing old, talking about herself. She says, when you reach my age, your life is no longer too embarrassing because you realize that everybody's life is embarrassing. This revelation allows a certain freedom to be oneself. I'm 51 today. Um, and it's better than 41. It's better than 31 and better than 21 for sure. And part of it is this lesson. Part of the self-disclosure I, I do is not raw for me. It's not, it's not um, worrisome because I, I've sat in enough rooms and therapy sessions to realize that everybody's underbelly looks the same. We, we run professional retreats for uh, therapeutic retreats for professionals who, who work sometimes in the same field. And initially there's a lot of resistance to that. Like, how am I, how can I bear myself, my, myself to, to people that I make referrals to and make referrals to me? That's a very scary proposition. And, and what all I can tell them is from experience, both as a participant and one who facilitates these, that everybody's underbelly is essentially the same. And I trust you more. I trust you more when you can talk about yours. When you're hiding it, it's more difficult to trust you, to connect, to trust myself with you and my own flaws with you. And I think this goes back to being a parent in a way, right? That's part of Evoke is about parenting. And part of it is your children don't need you to be anywhere near perfect. They need you to embrace yourself. Warts, embarrassments, what I call the horrible, rotten self and all. And when you do that, then they can do that, right? You model it for them. And, and when you can do that, they're, you're safer to them. And I think that's a piece of what she's talking about. This is a section of the book where she's talking about intimacy and vulnerability. On intimacy, quote, she says, while self-disclosing is one way to be intimate, Social psychologist Carol Tavris reminds us it's not the only way. She writes, years ago, my husband have, had to have some worrisome medical tests. And the night before he was going to the hospital, we went to dinner with one of his best friends who was visiting from England. I watched, fascinated, as male stoicism combined with English reserve produced a decidedly unfemale-like encounter. They laughed. They told stories. They argued about movies. They reminisced. Neither mentioned the hospital their worries or the affection for each other. They didn't need to. Tavris reminds us that love is communicated in different ways and that connections take many different forms. Maintaining privacy isn't just one way to hide out. isn't just a way to hide out. It can simply be our preferred way of being. I had this discussion with somebody this week. Maybe it was my wife. I can't remember if it was my wife or a client or it could have been both, but sometimes our children... We, we need to allow them to preserve their dignity. And when we try to rip off and tear off the, their armor that they wear to protect themselves, we, we don't do that. And I think we want sometimes to, to rip off that armor for our children to, to validate what we know to be true so the child will be on board with the treatment or the, the, the consequence or, or the boundary that we're setting. I think that's really what it is. But I, I think what, what, what it requires, what, what Carol uh, Tavis is, is teaching us and reminding us is that we can hold space for other people. We can be ourselves. I can make a decision for a child without um, being validated by them, without them having to admit to something that, that's beyond them. 
I, I remember what it was that I was taught. It was about my daughter, my 12 year old, when there was a complaint by one of her teachers at school. And there was a point in the discussion when I, I, I felt it was entirely inappropriate for my daughter to be in the room while we were talking about her because we were exposing her. And I said clearly to the teacher, I said, it's not appropriate. We can talk about this with each other, but not with her in the room. It's unfair to her. And I could see the shame at what we were thinking was a, a minor revelation, but it was there. It's important to give children their dignity and to operate from the adult mind and to find our confidence and validation somewhere else. And talking about vulnerability and, and men, Dr. Lerner says, quote, Sam also learned to give voice to his vulnerability. He learned to say there are limits to what I can do. He needed to pay attention to when he was absorbing more stress than he could handle so that he could take better care of himself. This was a huge challenge for Sam, who tended to keep functioning until he was physically exhausted and totally depleted. Sam also learned to sit with Pamela, his wife's expression of grief, to give her the gift of his full attention without trying to fix her feelings or shower her with advice. He was scared that if he really made room for Pamela's grief and for his own, they would lose their capacity for joy and hope. It's important and it, and it tends to line up with men, but it can be both. In fact, Dr. Lerner even says, uh, refers to, I think her own family and talking about the oldest daughter in a family. Sometimes the hardest thing in the world is to say it's too much, right? I want to be a good husband and father, a good therapist and a good friend and a good boss, a good person, a good neighbor. And because my definition, the definition I was given to be good is to be capable and there for you, for others, for everybody. So for me to say I can't, just like it was for that woman taking care of her mother-in-law, for me to say I can't, I've reached my living, limit, is to confront a deep, deep, dark shame. So we can know that about each other, right? And we can be gentle with each other. And we can develop the courage and the patterns in our relationships to be able to say when it's too much for us. I, I hold to this day one of the most successful arguments, not arguments, excuse me, the thing that prevented an argument, one of the most successful interactions from with my wife and our, our combined 40 years, 45 years of psychotherapy. And in a moment when she needed something and I said to her, I can't right now, it would be too much. And she didn't punish me for it. And there's a lot more to that story, but that was me taking a huge risk in her showing a, a huge amount of compassion and strength and self-care. Do you believe the strongest, this is a question she poses, do you believe the strongest, most centered people have the capacity to be open and out there with the facts and with the full range of their emotional experience? I don't know if I always believe that. I don't know if that's what it always means. I believe in one area that is something, right? To be out there with yourself, to share. But it's an interesting part of the discussion that she poses and, and challenges us with. She talks about pure listening. I love this, this section of the book. Quote, it was even more courageous to shift into a place of pure listening. When we, are eight, when we are being judged or criticized or lectured to, we listen defensively. For the defense, for the defensively, we listen defensively for the defensively, for the distortions, exaggerations, and inaccuracies. I must have a typo in there. And inaccuracies in what the other person is saying. We listen to plan our next response. The challenge is to listen only to understand, to say, mom, do I have this right? And is there more you haven't told me? This shift from defensive listening to pure listening is truly a spiritual aspect and adventure of ours, unquote. So we talk about that. We talk about listening. One of the things that I think is, I, I think is critical to the work that, that, that we talk about and that we teach is this idea that um, you can do what you can do and you can't do what you can't do. And that um, 
when I'm talking to people about listening, sometimes I say, if you can't hear it, you can walk away or set a boundary. You can end the conversation. But part of our work and, and part of the work when I'm working with somebody is that you can get to a place where it doesn't hurt anymore. And, and part of that comes from when you realize it, it comes from, first of all, self-awareness, right? Getting in touch with and, and getting on really deep speaking terms with who you are and your authentic self. That, that's the first part. And then because of that, when somebody says something that others might feel hurtful or you might have felt hurt by at, at an earlier phase of your life or in a more vulnerable moment in your life, it doesn't hurt. You're not faking it. You're not suppressing feelings or acting or pretending. You're not hurt by it because you know that the thing that they're saying is not about you. But if it does hurt, you're allowed to protect yourself with the boundary. She talks about this idea of pretending. And I'll talk about it because I, I think the word has a really negative connotation. And, and when you when you read through this, this section of the book, it, it's, it's more like skill building, practice. Fake it till you make it. And, and this is a letter that she coached um, from an anxious pursuing husband to a, a, a wife who left him because she was feeling overwhelmed and, and smothered by him. And every attempt for him to try to re-engage her had that, that anxious attachment style and pushed her further and further away. So Dr. Lerner, she does this a lot in her book. She, we do this at, at Evoke, right? We help you write letters because they're, they're so deliberate and intentional and we can, we can work through it slowly. And sometimes when I'm asking you to write, write a letter, I'm almost, I'm almost pretending that the letter is the thing. And what I'm really saying is this is what it sound, would sound like if you were a healthier self, a self, and if you were uh, capable of providing connection, the, the, the connecting aspects of a relationship to your child. So here's the letter that, that she had her client write, and he wrote, quote, Dear Jill, I apologize for being on your back and not respecting your need for space. I feel like I've turned a corner. I've started therapy and I'm getting the help I need. This crisis has forced me to take a good hard look at myself and my contribution to the problems in our marriage. I realize that I need to focus on my own issues at this time. I know we both have a lot to think about and I support whatever you need to do for yourself. I want you to know that I'm going to be okay and that I'm taking good care of myself. I love you and hope we can make the marriage work. Whenever you're ready to talk, let me know. There are parts of this letter that, that of course, are unique to, to a marital couple's relationship. But in essence, we ask you to write very much the same kind of letter to your child. It's so easy, and our children do such a go good job of wearing the, the identified patient garb, right? They, they, they wear the costume well. They get themselves into this mix really, really well. Um, but, but part of a shift as the pursuer in a parental parental relationship is taking care of yourself. There are versions of this letter that I've asked all of you to write, which is I'll take care of myself and I'll be okay. And I'm sorry. I'm sorry for, for, for laying on top of you, my peace and serenity. That's my responsibility. And I'm here when you're ready to talk. And the outcome of this letter and this therapy from Dr. Lerner's book was, and there was more to it than this, was that they came back close together. But part of it was a shift on the part of the pursuer, changing the dance, changing the dynamic, and making it safer for the person who he identified as the one with the problem. He, he thought she just wasn't responding to his love. And I think so many of us parents think that same thing. More in pretending, Dr. Lerner says, quote, but what at first felt like pretending led him to get more in touch with what he later called, quote, the higher truth, unquote. He did need to work on himself. Jill did need space. He was going to be okay, even though it didn't feel that way to him at first. Tim's accomplishment was not simply that he penned 
the strategically correct words to Jill. More important, his words reflected a mature and loving attitude that he thought was out of his reach. And they summarized a plan that could move him toward becoming the person he wanted to be, unquote. This is the work. This is what it means. And it takes time. And, and Dr. Lerner happens to be a very gifted therapist and a very gifted writer. She articulates these concepts well. I have had the, 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 the privilege of a lifetime of sitting across from a very gifted therapist who could do this for me, do this kind of work for me. And my work has take, taken 51 years. This, this broadcast tonight has taken me 51 years to prepare for. And, and so at Evoke, in our work, in, in the books that I've written, in the podcasts that we're doing, we're, we're asking and inviting a, a, different, a different way, like those little children in the sandbox at the beginning of, of her book. We're asking, we're teaching what it would be like to be like those children. More on pretending. Feelings are, are okay. I wrote this. Feelings are okay, but one's ability to think about how those feelings affect another is a valuable asset also. And this is how Dr. Lerner says it. Quote, but it's never useful to drown in emotions or to lose the capacity to think about how we want to express them. In Tim's situation, staying with his feelings and voicing them to Jill wasn't going to, wasn't going to help him for more than a few minutes during his time of crisis. It was Tim's capacity to think, to consider how his words were influencing Jill and affecting his own well-being that ultimately saw him through the crisis. His willingness to seek help and line up support for himself was a critical first step. So, to be clear, what I am asking you in this work, no matter where you are, no matter if you've never been an Evoke Therapy, Wilderness Therapy client or intensive client before at all, what I am inviting, what Dr. Lerner is inviting is that um, not inauthenticity, it's not a lie. And the mistake that, the, that we make when we conflate honesty with, with telling everything that comes right off the top of our head, especially during moments of anxiety or, or anger, that that's the truth. There's another side to the story. And part of... of, of a resource that, that we can access is uh, the, the wherewithal to understand how it impacts your child. And so the justification, and I hear kids, kids in the wilderness say this all the time, the justification to say something unkind or hurtful, something that, that makes something worse, the justification I hear all the time is, but it's the truth. And my response is, it's not all that. Punching somebody in the nose isn't the truth. It's punching somebody in the nose. So learning to think about our emotions with the help of a therapist. That's why a, an adequate container, that's just a clinical term for a decent therapist, an adequate container can help you sort this out like Dr. Lerner shares that he helped with Tim in this example. She distinguishes pretending out of fear versus well, versus faking until you make it, right? If we pretend out of fear because we might re be rejected, that's not what she's talking about. She's talking about run around the track a few times. Start to feel what it feels like. In Al-Anon and AA and 12 Steps, they, they have the phrase, fake it till you make it. It's what I call overriding the old programming with the new software. I learned about... 15 years ago or so, 12 years ago or so, I learned that I wasn't going to be unafraid when I took the insights and the, and the skills from therapy into my life. I learned that I was still going to be afraid, and I still am today, often. But what I can do because of the foundation of the practice of doing my work is I can do it scared. I can do it anxious. Just recently, uh, I set an appropriate, healthy, not unkind boundary with my wife, and she had a reaction to it. It wasn't overwhelming. It's just 
she pulled away a little bit. And I had to override my, my anxiety and my fear of being rejected to not pursue her. Like that would be unkind of me. I would be forcing her to not only respond to my boundary that I set, that wasn't unkind, but also to like it and be happy about it. So in this work, and in really, in these podcasts, we learn what it's like to be like those children. She talks about overfunctioning and underfunctioning quite a bit, actually. And if you're an overfunctioner, she talks about sharing more vulnerability, not less. To, to create balance in a relationship. So if you're the one that, that's always got it together, if you're the strong one, the one in, in, in less crisis, it might help to share more vulnerability. She says, practice sharing more vulnerability, not less, especially if we're entrenched over functioners. With parents, it's the not knowing self. I have to learn in every session I participate in, because I get asked so many questions about what I know and what the answer is, I have to practice and concentrate on not, not remind, reminding myself I don't know. I don't know the answer. I don't know your answer. I, I sometimes know mine, but I definitely don't know yours. And, and that's, somebody was telling me recently, they thought their children needed a stable, consistent person in and, and, and one way they do but they also need the not knowing you the person who does change who can be wrong there's learning and growing dr learner says quote substantive change doesn't occur in in one hit and run conversation family pan patterns change slowly sometimes she talks about this more than once. She talks about this in The Dance of Anger, and I, and I, I can relate to this in, in a crazy way. Like, I, I summon up the courage to set a boundary with my wife, with somebody. I, I say the thing. I do the thing. And it takes a lot of courage. I walk through a lot of fear. And I don't want to have to do it again. And that's a mistake. That's a, that's a thinking error. We're going to have to do it again. We're going to have to, to, to prepare for change back messages. We can predict, we can, we can think about predictable responses and learn that we're going to have to change that over time. We, we like to get very righteous when we've stated our, our, our boundary, our, our truth one time and the other person doesn't completely change their, their, their trajectory from then on. We, we get really righteous about that. Right. But Dr. Lerner reminds us that we have to, Keep doing it. I love this quote from her. This one that says, quote, we all resist change even as we seek it. That's, isn't that amazing? All of us. Be kind to yourself. She talks about preparing a script. I think a script can be helpful. That's one of the, sometimes when um, I'm working with a, an individual in a couple situation or in a parenting situation, I'll often say, Send me a letter, a one-page letter, less than one page, of something you want to say to your child, to your sister, to your brother, to your to your spouse. And let's talk about it. And I'll write. I might just write you back one that comes from a different place. I'm not telling you what to write. You don't have to write it. But let's talk about the differences and where you're at. But preparing a script can help because in moments of tension, in moments when our nervous system is aroused. Well, that's really what it is. Our inability to think clearly is because our nervous system is aroused. When our nervous system is aroused, we, we, we lose clarity, the capacity to think. Dr. Lerner says this, quote, in role-playing such conversations in our therapy sessions, Janet joked that she might need CPR after uttering the first sentence. In a, in a specific story, she felt wildly anxious at the very thought of sharing her vulnerability with her sister and reaching for Belle's competence to respond supportively. I suggested that she prepare a script which gave Janet a plan for controlling her anxiety. So all of us, right? Well, Ram Dass says, 
If you think you're enlightened, spend a week with your family. All of us can lose the capacity to think and to reason and to respond rationally. And scripts, letters can help. That's why in our program, the, the, the wilderness therapy program that we have, we do letter writing therapy. That's why some of the work that we do in the intensive work is writing letters, right? Role playing. What would it look like if I was a healthy self? And what would it look like if, if without compromising that, I was there for you? Your nervous system. Dr. Lerner says this, quote, Sam also learned to sit with Pamela's expression of grief. I already, I already shared this, this quote with you. But it, but it goes on into something else. To give her his full attention without trying to fix her feelings and shower her with advice. He was scared that if he really made room for Pamela's grief and for his own, they would lose their capacity for joy and hope. And then going on, she says, quote, but these two steps are enormously, these two steps are enormously difficult. She was talking about a two-step plan that she has for, for clients. Are enormously difficult to put into action when you're dealing with a high twitch subject, right? Something that is likely to trigger um, upregulation in your, in your nervous system. When you're dealing with, with a high twitch subject, your brain will turn to mush. You won't have a clue what questions to ask. The concepts of speaking to the differences will totally elude you. Again, this is in reference to a specific skill that she's encouraging. If you're drowning in emotions, you won't draw on your creativity or even your common sense. You'll get critical, defensive, or just plain mad. When this happens, or ideally before it does, you'll need to think and plan. Find a clear thinking friend to help you walk through the process because it's almost impossible to apply your best thinking to your own family. Again, be kind to yourself and realize that no matter who you are, you can be compromised in situations that, that trigger you, that tap into old, old relationships, contexts, trauma responses, or, or things that just threaten you today. I started off tonight talking about how this is a book about connection, but it's really a book about boundaries, the boundaries of self and, and where they intersect with, with those that we love and care about and seek to have a connection and a relationship with. Dr. Lerner says this, quote, if we do reach a point that we cannot take more of the same, we will act and speak from a new and different place. It won't be a matter of changing the other person, but rather saying, look, as I see it, your behavior is hurting our relationship. I can't continue this way and still feel good about myself or you and our life together. When we really mean it, we won't get sidetracked any longer by the person's protests or counter moves. The other person may say, you don't accept me the way I am, or you're trying to change me, or you want to control me. These predictable reactions are not to the point. Only the other person can decide how he will behave. When we get to the point, when we draw uh, kind of our bottom lines, when we decide enough is enough, we won't be moved by the other per person's uh, protests. Their counter moves. It's a different place that we're coming from. That other place that she's talking about is the place where we threaten, give ultimatums, become passive aggressive and emotionally coercive. This is a different place. There's this idea that I think about all the time about learning to trust yourself. And she talks about it this way, quote, it's not useful to drown in emotions or allow our reactivity to, pro to propel us into unwise speech or action. In order to get past a purely reactive voice, Lorraine, one of the clients she tells a story about, needed to get a grip on her anxiety and intensity. At the same time, she needed to listen to what her body was telling her. <clears throat> That's the work, right? In this case, it was about a, a wife who was suspicious of her husband's relationship with somebody at work. And, and she did that work with Dr. Lerner. Dr. Lerner provided a context where Lorraine could find Lorraine and tease it out from old trauma and history and message and, and cultural expectations and pressures and, and what, what she was feeling and where it was coming from. And then Lorraine got clear with her husband. And it was a, it's a longer story, 
but they ended up doing tremendously, phenomenally wonderful and powerful and deep long-term work. This on being real, Dr. Lerner says, quote, some very fine people can't tolerate much criticism, even from or especially from their partner. When this is so, we need to consider how to choose our words and consider how to put things, even if we feel compelled to spontaneously say whatever we think. If we're not being heard, more of the same won't help. I'll say that again. If we're not being heard, more of the same won't help. Plus, being real is hardly a virtue when we're having a negative impact on the relationship. And there are many different equally real ways to make a point. It's not navigating and tiptoeing around somebody's defenses. It's owning your impact, how you show up. I said to somebody just today, one of the questions that you can ask when somebody in your life, in this case, it was a child, but it could be a spouse. If they're not talking, it takes wisdom and courage to consider what am I doing that makes it not safe? But it does take that courage and wisdom. There's something she calls the experiment. Family therapist Monica McGoldrick was conducting a workshop called Marriage, Divorce, and Remarriage at the Menninger Clinic. Someone in the audience asked what advice she would give to, and I put this in bold, this phrase, what advice she would give to a woman who couldn't get clear, not, not one that was clear, but a woman who couldn't get clear about whether to stay in an unhappy marriage or, or leave. McGoldrick says, I tell her to do an experiment for nine months. During this time, she should make a 100% commitment to being the very best partner she can be. She should be the partner that she wants her spouse to be for her. She should also work on herself, including her relationships with her family of origin. If she's still thinking about divorce after that, she should probably go ahead. A colleague sitting next to Dr. Lerner during this lecture, uh, she says this, quote, a colleague sitting next to me bristled at McGoldrick's advice. She's a feminist? She whispered to me, and her solution is for the woman to become the perfect wife? When we talked later, I learned that my colleague had heard McGoldrick prescribing dishonesty. The woman contemplating divorce was surely feeling angry and critical and undoubtedly had many legitimate complaints that shouldn't be suppressed or glossed over. But, unquote, but the idea is work on yourself. By the way, work on yourself even if you are going to get a divorce. Is it right to send your child to wilderness therapy, to our treatment program? Maybe, but work on yourself starting now. I told a parent inquiring about our program today, I said, you're going to have to do this work anyway. E even if your child comes to our program or another program, and it's of any, it's a, it's a program of any respectable value, you're going to do the same work I'm asking you to do that potentially prevents the crisis. Potentially. So you just work on yourself. And, and and I said this today. I haven't been in couples therapy in, in, I don't think, in 10 years. I go to family therapy on occasion with, with my children. When I say on occasion, is once in a while. Once in a great while. But I go to therapy every week and I work on my relationship with my spouse and my children there because it's me. And if, if divorce is, is what's indicated because I, I get to a point that whatever's going on with my wife is not tenable for me, it'll come out of that work. But it will be built on the foundation of me being the highest version of myself, a higher version of myself. John Gottman talks about the four horsemen. He did research on, 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 on behaviors, interactions that predict divorce. And he listed the four horsemen as predictors of divorce in order of their, their, their power. Horseman number one, criticism, a personal attack. That's the biggest risk. Contempt is number two. It can be passive contempt like eye rolling and sighing or overt like, like name calling or sarcasm. Defensiveness, I don't have the problem. 
or stonewalling, which is just cut off. Those are the four horsemen. And so those are the things to watch out for. That's our work, right? And then he says this, which I think is cool. He says in his research, he also found, but if we keep a five to one ratio of positive versus negative interactions or comments or behaviors, the four horsemen lose their power and become non-lethal, non-lethal to the marriage. I think that's an interesting bit. So what are the take-homes? Yes, there's so much in this book. I, I, I could do two or three broadcasts just on this book. So that's why we're going just a little bit over an hour. Um, and I'm going to take your questions on Thursday night. If you have questions about this, you can send them in any time and listen to them later if you want to. Um, but here are the, the, the take-homes. We put our parents or, or our others on the hot seat when we do our work. And we expose the emotional immaturity of our parents as we do our work. There's a story she tells you. She says, Joyce felt she had stood up to her mother by responding with, to her snippiness with sarcasm. Actually, Dr. Lerner points out, she protected her mother by responding in kind and by not taking the conversation a step further. So if we uh, attack back, we let them off the hook because we're just as much part of the problem. But a courageous, assertive, clear, wise, maybe even compassionate comment, self-assertive comment, that puts other people on the hot seat. And it's scary because we're used to being, being obliterated when we do that. She talks a lot about finding our authentic voice. There was a, there was a client in her story in, one of, in, her, in her book that blew up at, at her alcoholic sister. And it was a turning point in the relationship because this client finally blew it. My children have told me that some, some of the greatest moments are when I've blown it because I'm not perfect. And it's a, it's a vivid example when I blow it that I'm not perfect. That gives me some comfort. Again, it doesn't, it doesn't, uh, it doesn't take away my responsibility to try to do my work but it allows me to be a self, to be a person. It's a, it's a work of balancing our vulnerability and embracing your strength at the same time, like being all of you. Not all vulnerable, all in crisis, all needy all the time because you're not that, but also being strong. And if you're always strong, embracing your vulnerability, it's that, that's the life's work. In, in marriage, finding the cracks early on that later become large crevices, crevasses, right? Like, find them. They're there in courtship. Dr. Lerner says it in her book. I say it in my book. It's there in the beginning. It's there when it looks like romantic, infatuated love. If our partners didn't fit together with our wounds, we wouldn't be attracted to them. They would be a different animal and we wouldn't recognize or we wouldn't be, they wouldn't be compelling to us. I, I talk about when I do couples work and couples intensives, I'm not in the business of, of telling people to get a divorce, right? I'm, I'm really not in the business of telling people what to do, period. But divorce, uh, think about this, this thought experiment. Divorce has to be an option. You know what happens if it's not an option. People spend decades in miserable, unhappy ex experiences. And sometimes only when it becomes an option does the relationship shift. For, for the person who's on the side that's getting hurt and suffering dramatically, both are usually suffering. But the person who's more vocal about their suffering? And it, 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 it changes the conversation. Then you're not in prison anymore. And if you're in prison and the only hope you have to relieve your suffering is that the guard gets nicer, you're doomed. So you've got to get out of the prison. So sometimes I figured out in my marriage, the divorce had to be an option, a thoroughly explored option for us to finally find what we call marriage 2.0, to finally find an intimacy that I had never known before. Dr. Lerner says it this way, quote, only after we know that we can live without a relationship and feel entitled to make that choice can we think, speak, and act clearly within it. We can't take the bottom line position. We can't 
take a bottom line position in any relationship. She asked the question, why should we practice kindness when the other person is behaving badly? And there's a lot that she says about that. One answer is because it feels better. And it comes from a place of capacity and love. We do it because we can. Because we find sources to fill our belly up spiritually. And we can. And that feels so much better. There's a story that she tells in this one and also in the, in the book. She expands on, a, on her apology book that I also did a broadcast on where she talks about a daughter confronting the mother and how at the, at the point of the confrontation on, on Christmas Eve, it was too much for the mother and overwhelmed. And how the mother took the opportunity in the, in the subsequent weeks, maybe months, to write short, non-threatening invitations to her daughter and, and eventually open space where the mother could listen to the daughter express profound hurt disappointment and grief toward her mother. And here's my final thought for the evening that I'm quoting, stealing from Dr. Lerner. Quote, obviously, this is a story about her father making a, 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 a negative comment about some woman's hair. And, and Dr. Lerner, uh, her hair was very, very similar. She says exactly like this woman. They were sitting in a car together. That's the background. That's the context of this quote. Quote, obviously people are most likely to hear us if we are letting them know that we love them and that they are important to us, that we may not get des the desired responses painful, but beside the point. The conversation I had with my father in the car about my hair wasn't intended to get to him or to move him. That's important. It wouldn't have had the same quality if that's what the intention was. The conversation I had with my father in the car about my hair wasn't intended to get to him or to move him, or to even evoke an apology or behavioral change. I knew from past experiences not to expect this, but just as I knew not to expect my hair to behave, just as, ex as I knew not to expect my hair to behave, but I wasn't going to protect him either. I simply needed to hear the sound of my own voice speaking to my father without backing down. I'm not going to take questions this evening. If you have them, um, like I said, if you have them, I'm going to do an open Q&A, send in questions in advance um, to webinar at evoketherapy.com, and I'll address them, and, and you can listen to them recorded later. You can also send in questions from family members and friends. This is one on Thursday you can invite family members to, and friends too, so we'll do some of that follow-up on Thursday if you're interested. Uh, let me run through upcoming events real quick. Our parent support groups, I'll be in the Bay Area on February 26th at 7 to 9 p.m., at the San Mateo Airport. We'll have a parent meeting in Portland, Oregon on Friday, March 6th. And I'll be in Southern California Sunday, April 5th from 4 to 7 p.m. That's Sunday. Doing it on a Sunday for those of you who complain about traffic in L.A., which is a legitimate complaint. Email or respond to Keisha at evoketherapy.com. K-A-Y-S-H-A at evoketherapy.com. Keisha at evoketherapy.com. For more information or to RSVP, our next parent workshop is February 15th. We ask all current parents to go. Talk to your evoke therapist about that and RSVP to Keisha at evoketherapy.com. Our intensives are starting to fill up. We're going to probably move to two a month. February is full. March is um, got one spot left. March 4th through 8th, that's one that I'm doing. April 22nd through 26th, we have four spots left. And then we have one May 27th in England. I'll be there May 8th through 10th. That will fill up ahead of time. And then finding you too, if you've been to a finding you, you want to come to another one, Finding You too. I'll be running this one, July 15th through 19th, is almost full. You can also get customized couples, families, and we do professional workshops also. So go to our website or email intensives at evoketherapy.com for more information. Our pursuits trips are for young adults or families who want therapy, light, and adventure kind of mixed together, trips all around the world, anywhere from a few days to a, to a month. We ask all current families to go to six 12-step support groups, any combination of Al-Anon, CODA, Families Anonymous, or Adult Children. Uh, Alateen is for teens. Refuge Recovery is a support group for people that, that maybe struggle a little bit with a higher power. It's more Buddhist-based. And then the National Alliance on Mental Illness, NAMI.org, is a great resource for free resources and classes in your area. All of these broadcasts are available on your favorite podcast app on an iPhone using the podcast app or Android device. We, we encourage the SoundCloud app, or you can go to soundcloud.com. 
On Twitter and Instagram, you can find Evoke Therapy by using the handle at Evoke Therapy. You can also find our intensives program on Instagram using at Evoke Therapy Intensives. On Facebook, you can find Evoke by searching Evoke Therapy Programs. You can find the Alumni Found- Foundation on Facebook by searching Evoke Family Foundation. Our blog has new content each week. My old book, my, my first book, The Journey of the Heroic Parent, and my upcoming book as of February 24th will be out. The new book is called The Audacity to Be You, Learning to Love Your Horrible Rotten Self. And like I said, I'll take upcoming questions this Thursday. I'll be back talking to you Thursday night, February 13th at 7 p.m. Mountain Time. This one is available to family, friends, siblings. It's one of the ways that we give support, send in questions in advance. Have your family and friends send them in. Uh, Tune in live to listen or listen to the podcast that gets released the following day to hear me answer and address your questions. Thank you. Thank you for joining us this evening. I know this was a long one. Thank you for the work that you're doing. Thank you for and on behalf of your children and those in your life that that you love and who love you for your willingness to to go into the dark cave where the the, the treasure hides. So I thank you. I hope this is a a helpful point of contact. Have a great evening and I'll talk to you Thursday night. Take care. Bye-bye.